All right. Hi, welcome back. Attorney Steve Andrade here. Today we are talking about artificial intelligence. All right. This stuff is exploding. I don't know if you guys are following all the different AI apps, mobile apps that are coming out. Incredible, the things that we're seeing. So here we have the California State Bar, the Cal Bar, um, that regulates lawyers and uh, does things for the public and whatnot. Um, they have come out with a set of guidelines, practical guidance for the use of generative AI, let's just call it AI, in the practice of law, okay? So here you can read that if you want. I'm gonna to skip to their, to their guidelines, but they're just basically saying that how this is important. They realize that this is going to be used in the practice of law everywhere, and so they're just putting out some guidelines as to what you need to be able to, to do in your practice and things to think about. Ethically, mainly in regards to your ethics, okay? Here's some of their tips. All right, number one, in regards to duty of confidentiality. As lawyers, we have the duty of confidentiality to our clients. AI products are able to utilize the information that is input. So in other words, I can go to chat GPT and I can put, say, a, uh, say a client from um, San Francisco has a software company called blank that's doing creating products known as this or that. So what they're saying is you need to be careful with what you're inputting because you, as attorneys, we have a strict attorney client privilege, duty of confidentiality, and the, word, the wording is very strict. It's at all peril to an attorney. You need to maintain attorney client relationship. So um, they're suggesting that um, including prompts and uploaded documents. There are tools now where you can upload a document and it will analyze it. For example, I have LexisNexis that I use for my um, search tool and you can upload a pleading and you can, it can analyze a pleading for you and give you tips and suggestions, which, which is incredible. So when you're doing things like that, be careful that a lawyer must not input any confidential information of the client into these solutions. A lawyer must anonymize client information or redact as we sometimes call it and avoid entering details that can be used to identify a client. So it seems kind of common sense and, but again, you know, not all lawyers know how to handle new technology and nor do we know what the new uh, products are going to offer, what the offering is. And they may say, input the name of your client. Well, just because it says it doesn't mean you can do it. A lawyer or law firm should consult with IT professionals or cybersecurity experts to ensure that any AI system in which a lawyer would input confidential client information adheres to stringent security, confidentiality, and data retention. Make sure you're working with, I mean, let's face it, there are going to be thousands and thousands of artificial intelligence programs that are gonna pop up, websites, analytical tools, mobile apps, there's gonna be all these things popping up and you shouldn't just willy-nilly start using any company that you know is holding out its shingle. Make sure you're working with a reputable company. A lawyer should also here review the terms of use or other information to, to determine how the product utilizes the inputs. So go in, pull up the terms of use. What does it say? What do they do? So a lot of this, as you can see, is labor intensive but when you're a lawyer, there's a high standard on you, okay? So breaching your, your duties can lead to serious problems, okay? So uh, be careful, re review the, the terms of use. A lawyer who intends to use confiden in confidential information in a AI product should ensure that the provider does not share, uh, okay? All the companies these days wanna share your information. That's what we call uh, privacy. That's what privacy law is all about. Make sure they're not sharing that information. And that's a big key because I'll, I'll be honest with you, most companies you work with are probably going to say we share that information. So you need to think about whether you actually want to do business with them. Next, duties of competent and competence and diligence. A lawyer has a duty of competence, diligence. It is, it, it is possible that AI generative outputs could include information that is false, inaccurate, or biased. Okay, I don't know about the biased personally, but I have seen false inaccurate all day long on ChatGPT. And matter of fact, last time I went to look uh, to search on ChatGPT for a, a legal question and, and requesting citations, 
it spit out some uh, answers that were not good. And then recently, I have found that they don't even answer legal questions anymore. So you can check that out, see if it's true. But that's what I have found. A lawyer must use in, and ensure competent use of the technology, including the associate, associated <coughs> benefits and risks, and apply diligence and prudence with respect to facts and law. Before using uh, AI, a lawyer should understand to a reasonable degree how the technology works. That may not be simple. May not be easy to figure out how the technology works, okay? Um, its limitations and the applicable terms of use and other policies governing the use and exploitation of client data by the product. Me personally, I would never put any client data into any of these systems or any other system. Um, I think that's way too risky. So um, if you are using any AI app or tool that says, I need your client's information. I think that's just a complete no-no, me personally. Uh, Over-reliance on AI tools is inconsistent with the active practice of law and application of trained judgment by the lawyer. AI-generated outputs can be used as a starting point, totally agree, totally agree, but must be carefully scrutinized, totally agree. They should be critically analyzed, totally agree. Problem is, so you start relying on these tools, and then by the time you spend all this time verifying everything, you might as well have just done it yourself, okay? So I think that's where we're at right now. That may change in the future. Uh, 20 years from now, that may not be the case. It may be solid gold, the responses that you get. Also, review for accuracy and bias, supplemented and approved if necessary. A lawyer must critically review, validate, and correct both the input and output of AI to ensure the content accurately reflects. And again, we're just kind of repeating things here. Uh, be careful with the accuracy, folks. I don't think it's here right now. So um, you're going to have to give that time. Let's go duty to comply with the law. What's this? Business and profession code under California law. A lawyer must comply with the law and cannot counsel a client to engage or assist in the client to conduct that the lawyer knows is a violation of the law. So you can't, um, of course, we cannot counsel people how to break the law. That's not the job of a lawyer. And if they're doing that, you have a lawyer that needs to be looked at a little bit more closely. There are many relevant and applicable legal issues surrounding AI, including but not limited to compliance with AI laws, privacy laws, cross-border data laws, intellectual property laws. That's my field and cybersecurity concerns. A lawyer should analyze the relevant laws and regulations. Okay, so they're just saying, keep abreast of the laws. You have a duty of, of uh, to comply with the law, of course, and matter of fact, we all do, not just lawyers. So yeah, keep your eye on that. Um, duty to supervise lawyers and non-lawyers, responsibility of subordinate lawyers. So as attorneys, we have to, uh, if we have people underneath us, just like a real estate broker, you have to supervise real uh, brokers have to real uh, supervise licensed real estate activities. As lawyers, I have to supervise uh, lawyer activity beneath me and um, across from me and things like that. Managerial and supervisory lawyers should establish clear policies regarding the permissible uses of AI. So have some policies make reasonable efforts to ensure the firm adopts them. And again, so in other words, you can see where this is going, policies and procedures for your company, okay? So if you're going to be implementing, and again, trust me, trust me folks, all the apps and tools, they're gonna be, I guarantee you 2024 is gonna blow, it's gonna blow up your screen with all the new legal related apps that are gonna come out there. And by the time, uh, during this decade, it's gonna, it's gonna be crazy. So if you're gonna engage these um, apps, you need to let your, your clients, your other attorneys, you know, you have to have some policies and procedures in handling all this. So that makes total sense to me. Next, communication regarding AI use. A lawyer should evaluate their communication obligations throughout the representation based on the facts and circumstances, including the novelty of the technology risks associated with generative AI use, scope of the representation, and the sophistication of the client. So if you're dealing with tech clients, they're probably not gonna require as much. And if people don't know anything about the tech, you probably have a bigger duty to explain what you're doing, how you're using AI, and how this could be to their benefit. 
while also guarding against any potential risks of, of ineffective rep representation. The lawyer should consider disclosure to their client that they intend to use the AI, including how it will be used, the benefits, the risks. Um, and again, I think this is really important now if you're adopting AI, and there's not a whole lot of things I have adopted right now, to be honest with you, um, but, but it is getting there and I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of tools. Uh, charging for your work, a lawyer has to charge reasonable fees. We all know that, that's a ethical rule. Attorney fees must be reasonable. And there's a bunch of factors that determines what's reasonable. But a lawyer may use AI to more efficiently create work product and may charge for the actual time spent, we know that. Example, crafting and refining inputs and outputs and prompts, okay? This is gonna be a big area, folks. For your kids, um, learning how to be a prompt master, how to master prompts in all the different industries in the world, which are quite a few, how to get the most out of AI. Trust me, that's going to be there's going to be majors for that college majors. A lawyer must not charge hourly fees for time saved using AI. I totally get that. Why would you? I just save five hours, but I'm going to charge you the five hours. That would be uh, that would be unethical in my book. Um, costs associated with generative AI may be charged to the client. So just like I, we use LexisNexis, and we don't charge our clients, but a lot of law firms will charge for legal research and they may even charge you for, um, you know, doing that. So, but we don't here at Vondren Legal, home of the flat rate for legal fee for non-litigation cases. A fee agreement, you enter into uh, retainers with your client, fee arrangements, should explain the basis for all your fees and costs, including those with AI. So that's pretty clear. Full disclosure to your clients if you're using AI. Just let them know how what the benefits and the risks, how you're going to charge. So I like that. Candor to the tribunal and meritorious claims and contentions. What does that mean? A lawyer must review the outputs including not limited to analysis and citations to authority for accuracy. Like I said, I don't think it's anywhere near ready for prime time yet. A lawyer should also check for any rules, orders, or other requirements in the relevant jurisdiction that may necessitate the disclosure of AI. For example, maybe a federal court in Northern District of California says we have new local rules. If you're using AI for any of your briefings, you must note that. Again, I think that's not here yet, but I think it's very uh, forward-looking by the bar to recommend that. Prohibition on discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. That sounds interesting. Some generative AI is trained on biased information. Okay, so again, you don't know who's writing the code, who's training it, how it's working. So some of it could be based on certain biases that the, the uh, programmer has. And a lawyer should be aware of the possible biases and the risks they may create when using AI. Example, to screen potent potential clients or employees. So in other words, they may come up with a AI app. It may already be out there. They may be uh, citing this because it's already out there to screen employees. You may be some sort of screening tool. Learn to in, lawyers should learn to engage in continuous learning about AI biases and their implications in the legal practice. And firms should establish policies and procedures, mechanisms to identify, report, and address these biases. Okay. So um, what else? There's one more. You've hung in this long. You're doing great. You're going to be the most ethical and most technologically savvy lawyer on the planet. And here we go. Let's go. Professional responsibility owed to other jurisdictions. Okay. Um, a lawyer should analyze the relevant laws and regulations of each jurisdiction in which the lawyer is licensed to ensure compliance with such rules. For myself, I'm licensed in California and Arizona, so I should probably review the rules of both, and I will. And uh, But this is it, guys. It's really short, quick. I think it's uh, very forward thinking that they would put this out knowing uh, what's going to come in the practice of law and what's already here. But um, yeah, stay... Uh, Stay abreast of your obligations. Take them seriously. Learn as much as you can. Check your terms of service on your apps you're using. And do not engage in any, any risky behavior, guys. That's just going to put your license at risk. Makes no sense. All right. This is General Legal Information Only. Thanks for listening. If you like this, feel free to share it on your social media networks. AttorneySteve.com. Civil litigation.